Hi, I'm Daryl. I'm a certified rainwater harvesting designer and the founder of Yard Farmer, which is a sustainable landscape design studio based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. Today, we're gonna to be talking about rainwater harvesting and how you can do it in your own yard. Oftentimes, I'll bring up rainwater harvesting as a solution for our client designs. This could be active rainwater harvesting that uses tanks and barrels or passive rainwater harvesting that's just getting the rain directly to native plants. But either way, whenever I bring it up, a very common response I receive is, isn't that illegal where I live? And the answer pretty much always is no, it's not. And the fact that rainwater harvesting is illegal is very much a myth. So let's just dispel that myth right off the bat. Rainwater harvesting is almost never illegal in the continental United States. There are some states or municipalities that have more regulations or more restrictions than others. And we can get into those nuances a little bit, but in general, you're fine. First off, only one type of rainwater harvesting is being restricted at all, and that's active harvesting. We're gonna get further into the differences between active and passive, but at its core, active means you're capturing it from the sky, putting it into a tank, a barrel, a cistern, in order to use it for a specific purpose later. A lot of times, uh, states will have a maximum amount that you can harvest for your city or your state. In Utah, it's 2,500 gallons. In other places, it's twice that. In Colorado, which has some of the most stringent rainwater harvesting rules, it's just 110 gallons or 255 gallon barrels. But there are no regulations on passive rainwater harvesting. And what that is, is just getting the water to your plants directly and using earthworks or grading to make sure that that water, when it exits your downspout, doesn't just run off to the street. Essentially, we're digging around to create speed bumps for the water so that it absorbs and percolates into the soil. And guess what? When you use native plants in that case, native drought tolerant plants that are adapted to the rainfall and dry out periods of your region, then you really don't need to irrigate in the interim. A lot of folks, when I explain the concept of passive rainwater harvesting, they're saying, but I wanna get the water to the plants when it's not raining. The system you're describing is only watering the plants when it's raining. To which I reply, exactly. Because with a native plant, that plant is able to absorb the water that it needs and then go extremely long periods of time through drought and still survive. Sometimes those plants might go dormant. You'll see that in really hot, dry climates like Tucson, Arizona, for example. You could definitely keep a the landscape alive with no supplemental irrigation, but it's gonna go dormant and a little crispy during periods of long drought. But because you've done that grading and created the speed bumps, the swales for that water to absorb, the minute there's a monsoonal rain and all of those basins are filled up with water and then it absorbs into the soil, those plants will put out a brand new flush of growth and everything will be green and colorful again. I saw a thing just the other day when I was reading about the difference between the two and they were just like, yeah, they don't, like you just said, they don't care if you're directing the water because it's still going to go down yeah. to the water table. Yeah, exactly. So you're not taking anybody's resource away because yeah. the rain is owned by the public. Yeah. Yeah. And but also... If you capture it, you might be taking more than your share. Theoretically, yes. Like with active harvesting, it's very trackable how much water that you're technically capturing, right? And, they, and a lot of places where water rights have a lot of tension surrounding it. Yeah. They don't like that. However, it's very hard to regulate passive rainwater harvesting at all, regardless of if it's going back into the water table or not, because at the end of the day, all you're doing is letting your downspout drain out into your yard, which is how all downspouts drain. Like, oh no, your downspout is pointed at dirt. There's no way to regulate that. It's very easy for everybody to do, even in places like Colorado that have those really strict laws. So let's talk about passive rainwater harvesting and what that would actually look like. We can get into the math and uh, the volume calculations and everything like that later. Like I said before, it's basically creating speed bumps for the water, but rather than building things up, we're digging down a little bit. This could be as shallow as six inches in most cases, but creating some kind of swale. Sometimes they're referred to as basins. Sometimes they're referred to as rain gardens. You'll hear me kind of using those terms interchangeably. And we're allowing the water to enter that basin, spread around and percolate down. As far as how big to make those basins, that's where the math comes in, where you would actually be calculating the amount of volume going to that downspout. But before I let any of that overwhelm you, the main thing you need to to think about is this. If basin full, where water go? <laughs> and that's so silly, but that kind of caveman language is actually how I talk myself through imagining how water is going to move through a property and through a yard. And so if you've pointed a downspout at one of these swales and it fills up because it's raining a lot, 
where's the water going to go next? Before you get bogged down with volume calculations or square footage calculations, just pay attention to the gravity and the grade of your yard and be certain that if any of these rain gardens that you create fill up, that the water's gonna move away from your house and not back towards your house. If you do wanna get nerdy with me about the math portion, we're gonna be doing a webinar on passive and active rainwater harvesting a little later. We'll talk more about it later in the video, but you can click on over to the website to get that information. With passive rainwater harvesting, you're gonna wanna plant drought tolerant natives that are soft, like think grasses, perennials, that kind of thing, in the basins and then you can plant things that don't want to be sitting in standing water for even a short amount of time around the basins and those roots will still access the water so trees shrubs or depending where you live if these are native to you things like cacti and succulents could also live on the high points outside the basin those systems are able to survive extremely long periods once they're established without supplemental irrigation in a lot of cases that can mean just when it's raining so once these plants are established you could get away with perhaps not irrigating your yard at all of course depending on where you live and how crazy of a drought we're having that kind of thing and again just to make things simple for you so you don't have to overthink it it's always good to have a drip line or some sort of irrigation connection nearby so that if you are in a period of extended drought you could always flip that on to supplement but the goal I think could and should be that we're greatly reducing the amount of irrigation water we need to use in our yards now we're going to talk about active rain rainwater harvesting, which is what most people think rainwater harvesting is when those words are spoken. And that's tanks, barrels, cisterns, all of that good stuff. More often than not, the rainwater that we're capturing from our downspouts we're using in our irrigation. So there's not a lot that we need to worry about as far as filtration or dealing with toxins or impurities if we're just gonna go ahead and water our landscaping with it. But you can, of course, depending on the regulations in your city or state, capture rainwater and then actually use it for bathing or for culinary use. But that's a different, more complicated conversation. And if you're interested in that, let's start with seeing what your city and state even allow, and then you're gonna need to do a lot more infrastructure. If we're focusing on watering your plants, your vegetable garden, your grass, the main thing you need to know is that a 55 gallon barrel will fill up pretty quickly because most downspouts are capturing water off of at least a couple hundred square feet of roof. So an inch rainstorm is going to fill that up, I don't know, a dozen times over or more. So the active harvesting is just the first stop before the system connects into the passive harvesting system. So once that barrel's full, you'll have an overflow hose usually at the top of the barrel and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that that's pointed to the rain gardens, the basins, the swales, so that those systems can be connected. Cool thing about combining an active and passive harvesting system is that you can stretch those dry periods even faster and you could throw those tanks open and flood your passive systems during those periods of intense drought, preventing your plants from going dormant without having to tap into municipal irrigation or your well water or what have you. How's that sounding? Blew my mind actually. Yeah? Yeah, really? I learned something. Cool. What did you learn? The top spout. The top spout is for overflow because you want that system to be full and you want to keep the barrel full when it's overflowing. Right. So if we had the bottom one open, then the barrel would never and fill I, up. I also thought I could use that to like daisy chain barrels together, which you could. You 100% can. Didn't think about the fact that I could put a hose on there and direct that to my passive system. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Excellent. Yes, so you absolutely can daisy chain barrels together if you wanted to increase the amount you're actively harvesting. And so you'd have the, that hose from the top go to the next one and the next one and the next one. And then finally, that would still fill up all the way and overflow into your landscaping somewhere. I would not bother with active harvesting unless I have my passive system set up. I live in the Western United States where more than 60% of culinary water, drinkable water, is going to outdoor irrigation. And most people in the summer in the state of Utah and surrounding states are spending hundreds of dollars a month on supplemental irrigation. And a 55 gallon rain barrel, while full, is not going to affect your water bill and is not going to actually bring down the amount of water that you're consuming. But getting the water from your downspouts into a really thoughtful passive rainwater system would reduce your irrigation needs extensively. So until you have that system set up, I'm not that concerned with tanks and barrels. They're nice to have, but they're not actually going to move the needle as far as water conservation is concerned. The combination of them is pretty killer though. So in a perfect world, we'd all have uh, several hundred gallons or more actively collected that would overflow passively and then we could use the rain barrels in our vegetable gardens or just to get us through long periods of drought without having to 
irrigate. There are still some nuances you need to know about successfully actively harvesting water. Things like if you live in a cold climate, a winter climate, you are going to want to have some sort of bypass so you're not constantly filling your tanks while things are freezing because you're likely to break your barrels if they're filling up with water and freezing constantly. We call that bypass a first flush system and it's also really helpful because it captures the first flush of water off of your roof. Roofs are typically made out of asphalt shingle. There's typically a lot of gross stuff on that first flush of water. So we're preventing that water from going into our actively captured reserves. If you want to get into all the nitty gritty nerdy stuff with how to do a first flush system, that's going to be a webinar conversation. So again, head on over to the website to see what signing up for that looks like. Once you've designed your system and you have your swales dug, it's time to decide what you're going to plant in them. Like we talked about before, you're going to do native grasses and perennials in the basins, shrubs, trees, succulents, cacti, whatever's native to you outside the basins. So at that point, it really comes down to a matter of preference as far as color palettes are concerned, the types of plants that you like the most. But I would start narrowing down your list by finding only your drought tolerant native plants, the plants that are native to you in your eco region, but can also withstand some heat and withstand some drought. Those are going to be the most powerful in a rain garden. Now, if you're watching this from a less arid climate, like the Pacific Northwest or the East Coast, that's a different conversation because your rain gardens might actually actually have a little bit of bogginess associated with them. So you're going to be planting things like sedges and ferns and things that like a little bit of water in the soil. But if you're watching this from a desert climate where your soil's draining faster than you can look at it, uh, you're really going to want to stick to those exclusively drought tolerant plants. In an arid climate, there is really no such thing as a rain garden plant. It is just a drought tolerant plant that you get to water less. And I feel like I've been plugging the webinar enough, but we will talk about all of that in the webinar. So if you want more detailed information for your exact climate, that's where you're gonna wanna go. <laughs> if you're watching this and you feel like you'd rather me just figure all of this out for you rather than having you do all of the math yourself, I'm a certified rainwater harvesting designer and water conservation is a huge focus of our design studio. So if you wanted to hop on a consult, that's also something we could do. So we'd drill down and we'd discuss your numbers, your rainwater harvesting capacities on a call. And you could find any information with that at yourfarmer.co. Did you hear Lee say that? <laughs> 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 Thanks for watching. 